Welcome to the Literati Scene with Smokey Bacon and Dick Concanon and co-hosts Suzanne McDonald and Joanna DeTillo. So stay tuned. Our guest today is John Lark, who has been writing for many years for the New Yorker and has come out with a wonderful biography of Tennessee Williams. Uh, it's called The Pilgrims of the Flesh. It's Mad Pilgrimage of the <laughs> Mad Pilgrimage. <laughs> well, you know, I just have to say that, that that's, be, that's almost as good as the New York Post a couple of days ago, who referred to the book as a mad dash to go. <laughs> <laughs> well, the one thing I thought about that was you call it a pilgrimage. Correct. To the flesh. Of the flesh. Of the flesh. I went back and looked up pilgrimage again so that I could get it clear in my head. And it is normally to a place that is sacred. Indeed. And uh, tell me, was that your uh, well, initial idea? Yes, well, that's a really good question. And the answer is that the phrase Mad Pilgrimage of the Flesh is actually a phrase that Williams uh, coined in one of his short stories and also in his letters. And those five words sort of sum up his journey uh, from a uh, ascetic, hysteric, young Puritan man who uh, never had any sexual activity until, until he was 26, who was raised in an Episcopal ministry, and uh, who sort of reinvented himself uh, and in a sort of in, in, in a in a way uh, and embraced the sort of romantic idea of art and uh, transcendence through the flesh. He willed himself, in other words, to be a carnal being, to deliberate a, a sort of deliberate regression to toward the primitive, toward the instinctual and the unconscious, and that journey was his life's passion. He was. He was raised, as I said, in, a, in, a, in an Episcopal ministry, and instead of submitting himself to God, his whole journey and his whole literary mission, in a sense, was, make, was to make a God of the self, and to extend the idea of, uh, uh, to examine himself. When he started writing, he he said that he wanted to make a picture of his heart, and his heart, to, it, and to chart what he called his very divided, irrevocably divided self. So the plays uh, are really a, a, a chart of his interior, as his heart opened, flowered, and over time, largely because of drink and drugs and a sort of long series of failures after an even longer series of uh, acclaimed perform productions oh. uh, declined. Before we get into the book, as you are into it in the moment, I was looking for local ties. Now, Harvard has his papers. He has some of his papers. Harvard has the late period of his life, late period. the early period of his life, the, the, his youth and essentially most of his uh, uh, manuscripts and letters during the, the golden years, the years from 1945 to 1961 are held by Harry Ransom Center in Austin, Texas. And Columbia also has a very large holding. I mean, they, but Harvard's connection collection is is excellent and they in it's in what it has and there I found a lot of interesting late poems and letters uh, to his brother and uh, various agents so it's a good collection we have also 
a tie. Uh, Bette Davis was one of her. <laughs> Sorry for laughing, uh, but uh, there's a story. Uh, one of the, you know, you need a lot of luck when you write a biography over 12 years. And one of my pieces of luck was that Williams originally left all his papers to the university where his his grandfather went, and his grandfather was his most beloved uh, relative. And he went to, he went to the University of the South, Swanee. And at Swanee was a, 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 a taped interview, a, ta a, a manuscript rather, uh, written by the stage manager tonight to the night of the iguana, which in which Betty Davis was cast, uh, and. It said you know, not to be opened for 25 years, and it just so happened that when I was it was I was writing the book when those 25 years were up, and the the stage manager, who was a bit of a wag, uh, wrote this day-to-day -day account of her shenanigans, and it is eye-opening. And from my point of view as a, a theater historian. Absolutely wonderful, because part of the game of this book and, and in writing the kind of criticism I do is to try to give the reader a sense of what it's like to be inside the theater. The actual wonderful, awful uh, clash of dis uh, disputes and agreements that come together when you make uh, a show, which invariably ends up in a sort of narrative which has almost nothing to do about it all the chance mistakes that turn into the genius moments and the, the great genius moments that turn into terrible ideas. Anyway, Betty Davis's behavior uh, well, takes the biscuit for bad behavior in a, in, you know, as collaborators. She, she was so not a collaborator that she would not even sit with the cast at rehearsal. She had to have a space carved out for herself. And, at, and this is absolutely true. She, she, to say that she was a megalomaniac is to is to is is to diminish the the absolute rampaging bad behavior of this woman. But on opening night on Broadway, when she made her entrance and everyone applauded, she completely left the show, came down stage and went like this, like a prize fighter. She would, and so and and she's so 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 there goes your story right away. Um, and it was it made it impossible for the man who the actor who played Shannon to really sort of come on and start his performance. It was just a one. It's a wonderful account of what went on, including and very revealing about Williams because they needed to give Williams a day's notice to get to the theater. I mean, you know, they had to make sure that he was up, that he you know that that he had been coffeeed and washed and got to get him to the theater because he was not in a good state. So that it's a wonderful account and uh, it gives the, this last great play uh, a, a real vividness. The Night of the Iguana. Night, the Night of the Iguana, right. Uh, an aside, I used to vacation down in Puerto Vallarta before they moved down there and right. made the show. Uh, your work is to me almost, it seems more autobiographical because you've gotten inside this man's head uh, uh, more than even your biology, which you take care of very nicely. But there were a great number of people that affected his life other than the family. Ilya Kazan, wasn't he instrumental in success. Absolutely. Uh, I think that's another great piece of luck in this book, is that uh, Ilya Kazan's wit I met Ilya Kazan before he died, and it was very, he was, he, he was, uh, he was uh, as we say in England, a few sandwiches short of a picnic. But nonetheless, he was, uh, what was striking about meeting him was how forceful he was, how assured, and you got a sense of the charisma that he must have had when he was uh, functioning as a director, because he was a dynamo, and he still had, he, you could see that he was dynamic, it was great. And the luck was that his widow gave me 
carte blanche for all his letters, which uh, his archive is held at Wesleyan, and they control it to such a degree that they it would have been really hard otherwise to, to do that. So I could use the, the he, 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 he knew my criticism and he was prepared to let me do what I wanted with it because he trusted me. And the same was true of Audrey Wood, Williams' agent, whose uh, who's estate let me have access to material which otherwise uh, would not have been able to be used in a biography. In, William, in, in Williams' case, Williams really had no father to speak of, and therefore he had he had great lyrical powers. But that but the all the stuff that you would you might have if you had a strong father, the ability to to sort of you know all the practical pragmatic pragmatic organizational things, he 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 was not good at. And what what Kazan's real gift to Williams, I mean many, of many things was that he imposed structure on the plays. He gave the, he gave the plays a, a structure which took G Williams' great ideas and stories, but gave them a power and a thrust which Kazan sort of had himself. He was psychologically very astute and ironically, spiritually, emotionally, they both had similar parents, you know, came from similar oppressive households where the fathers Dis, dis, dismissed their ambitions and even denigrated them. Um, when Kazan, for instance, said he wanted to be an actor, which he was for a while, his father said, have you looked in the mirror? <laughs> uh, that was the kind of world that he came out of. In any case, one of the, this may sound odd, but one of the crucial things where they had a spiritual affinity was that they both understood and agreed that promiscuity was important to their art. Uh, they both, in, their, in both heterosexual and Williams' case homosexual area, they were, uh, they were quite busy. And, you know, sexuality is the beginning of knowledge and curiosity. And with Williams, you can see, you can actually see it in the writing, that he is a, a very competent playwright before he becomes uh, uh, actively, floridly sexual. But once he becomes sexual, his plays and his writing open, uh, opens himself up to a world, to feelings and experiences and compassion for people that really turn him into the powerful uh, playwright that he was. And also, it gives William, in a sense, Williams, in, wrote about this, that over time, the very thing that added brilliance to his plays, this deep knowledge of human experience and passion and desire, ultimately also created the opposite, created a certain barbarity, brought a certain kind of barbarity to his life. And that he wrote about in Two Character Play, uh, no, I'm sorry, in uh, Small Craft Warnings. So that the, he, he explores all of it in his plays. He doesn't hide anything. And that's why the plays, even the late plays, some of which are always competent, but perhaps they lack the lyrical shellac of the early work. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and uh, they make the, the less good plays still fascinating when you see what they're telling you about where he was inside himself at the time of the writing. So they still have something to tell us. And if we go to see them now with this information, my hope is that people will, uh, will get more out of them and enjoy them more. So what did he draw from Pancho and Melo? Well, the Pancho Rodriguez, and this is again another piece of luck for the for the book. There is only one interview ever made with Pancho Rodriguez, and um, I have it. I didn't do the interview, but it, I I inherited it from the uh, from the man uh, who wrote Tom, uh, Lyle Leverage, which was the first volume of Tennessee's authorized biography. 
and which he willed to me as part, I was supposed to do the second volume of his book. My book is not the second volume of his book, but I got his archive. And Poncho was a wild man. Poncho was the first man that Williams ever lived with. He was 33. He never had a relationship before. And uh, Poncho was crazy. He was uh, often drunk, incredibly jealous, violent, and uh, Tennessee he just loved being the object of desire. Uh, it was, and uh, in, in The Streetcar Named Desire, he, Poncho was the model for Stanley Kowalski. And in Streetcar Named Desire, there's a moment when Stella tells Blanche about her marriage night and how Stanley took off his shoe and knocked off the, and, and smashed the light. And, and Blanche says, oh, you must have been horrified, or something like that. And, 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 and Stella says, no, I, I, I found it kind of thrilling. And that is exactly what happened. Poncho did the same thing, except Poncho also just sometimes just destroyed the light bulb. But at one jealous fit, which I describe in the book, he actually tore up all of William's clothes and smashed his typewriter because Poncho was terribly jealous. He wasn't educated, but he was jealous of Williams's talent and his education. Uh, and uh, this, to just carry this a little further, what Streetcar dramatizes is the fact that Blanche has to be sacrificed so the relationship of Stella and Stanley, the, the marriage, the family, the desire can continue. In the same way, Poncho had to be sacrificed so William's creativity and playwriting could continue. He had to go. He was too chaotic. Williams couldn't do his work. And all the people around Williams were actively asking him, begging him, and in the, in the end protecting him from Poncho, who was like a heat-seeking missile. You know, he would intrude into everything. So the, in this way, and the, my book does this all, in, in almost every play, the play captures not consciously, but unconsciously, the very things that were going on in Williams' own life. Uh, and in some cases, right up to the very end, the last play Williams wrote a month before he died absolutely predicts how he died. Uh, uh, locked in a room, hearing voices.